Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 20th of April of 2020, and I'm going to be talking about peripheral vasopressors as well as how I manage my patients who are shocky, so to speak, and need vasopressors. I ultimately have quite the love-hate relationship with central lines. I sometimes get the warm and fuzzies when, for example, my emergency medicine colleagues call me for a borderline sick patient in the ED who is completely appropriate for the ICU after I look through the numbers and all that. And I see that they've already been properly tucked in and the patient has a right IJ, central venous catheter on the chest x-ray. The way things work at my shop is that I receive a secure text like text message, like a uh, message. God, that's redundant. Anyway, from the staff in the emergency department with a medical record number of the patient and some other details. So what I do is I take this medical record number before I even call them back, by the way, and pull them up on the EMR, quickly review the chart of the patient prior to speaking to the emergency medicine physician. Because in those 30 seconds that I take reviewing the chart, it, it provides me with great insight as to why I'm being called in the first place. Like I can see that they're hypotensive. I can see that they're on the vent. I can see that they have some pneumonia. I can see if they have like dirty urine, for example. And if the patient is sick, sick, well, yeah, it means that there's no reason why we should contemplate peripheral vasopressors. And again, if somebody needs a central line, they need a central line. And that's much appreciated by us upstairs in the ICU. My initial thought when a central line is already placed is that, hey, you know, it's good. This means I don't have to do it. But sometimes the patients are not as clear cut and you have to kind of navigate these waters, so to speak. Or perhaps we could get them over the hump without dropping a central line and going ahead and giving peripheral vasopressors a try. As a full disclosure, I mean, I, I don't know if many people who listen to this podcast understand how the pay structure for, for physicians takes place, but I am compensated for placing central lines. We are we are compensated for procedures. And this data is available, it's out through CMS, but the average Medicare reimbursement for a central line in 2021 is approximately $85, $86. And honestly, here I'm advocating for not placing central lines and attempting to use peripheral vasopressors in some cases, because again, it's all about choosing what's best for our patients. And to be quite honest, my first publication was actually on peripheral vasopressors. When I was in my fellowship, I worked with the great Dr. Sudhir Dutar, who is a neurocritical care physician, and he encouraged me to look into our utilization of peripheral phenylephrine. Part of the reason for this is because we use a lot of peripheral phenylephrine in the in the neuro ICU, and it was a very rewarding project. And the the paper turned out great. I'm very proud of it. And we've been cited 13 times since it was published back in 2017. Obviously, the study had some limitations. For example, it was a retrospective analysis. Um, I wish I could go ahead and share this with you, but we were able to get it published in a journal that's not open access. I, again, I wish I could share with more people. But what we did do was conclude from our findings that, quote, the infusion of phenylephrine through a peripheral IV is safe when used in a moderate dose for a short period of time and could be considered in lieu of placing a central line solely for this purpose. You see, there's a lot of time and energy as well as resources that go into placing a central line. Any, any of us who have placed a central line or assisted or anything like that knows these things. And this obviously includes the cost of a central line kit, as well as all the necessary accessories that go into doing the procedure. In addition, placing the line itself takes a certain amount of time, depending on factors such as a patient cooperation, anatomy, skill set, as well as assist assistance setting everything up. And therefore, the time that the clinician spends placing central lines is usually coupled by a similar amount of time spent by the bedside nurse who is you know, ready, willing, and able to help out throughout the process. And therefore, this is not just a physician or APP ordeal. This is something that takes a lot of resources from the whole healthcare system. And let's not forget about the most important component, though, and that is the patient. I mean, just, just the fact that you're discussing sticking a needle into somebody's neck, groin, or chest brings them a significant amount of concern. I mean, nobody wants to do that voluntarily. And therefore, sometimes we need to premedicate our patients as their anxiety goes through the roof. I mean, it's already the worst day in their lives. They're about to be admitted to the ICU. And then you're talking to them about putting something in their neck. That's, that's not really fun. 
That being said, I sometimes make a pact with certain patients who, you know, I'm able to mess around with them a little bit, joke around, at least bring some levity to the situation, where I communicate with them that if they feel any discomfort during the procedure, that they're allowed to punch me. I primarily choose the little old ladies to do this with because it won't hurt me as much. But so far, I'm happy to say that I have not been punched. And I also tend to be quite generous with lidocaine because, again, I do not want to make my patients miserable. That being said, there are numerous numerous complications that could take the place that could take place, excuse me, in the placement of a central line. And the data presented in the article that I'm going to be reviewing states that up to 2.1% of patients experience significant mechanical complications, such as a pneumothorax. Thankfully, I've never had a pneumothorax complication, but 2.1% is no no number to sneeze at or to take lightly. How does that saying go? I don't know. But in addition to this, between 0.5 to 1.4% of patients has symptomatic DVTs because of their central line. And 0.5% to 1.4% of patients experience bloodstream infections. Now, these are not numbers that one could just go ahead and ignore considering all the lines, all the central lines that we place in our respective practices. So what do we do about peripheral vasopressors? Let's find out. The paper that I'm using as a citation for this post was published just a few days ago on the 16th of April of 2021. It is titled, Adverse Effects, Excuse Me, Adverse Events Associated with Administration of Vasopressor Medications Through Peripheral Intravenous Catheter, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Now let's get the limitations out of the way first. They, they analyzed a number of studies and, you know, the 14 main studies that they used, only two of these were randomized trials. It's also challenging to compare, say, phenylephrine versus norepinephrine, vasopressin, et cetera, as all these different medications and vasopressors that we use in our practice all have different pHs, so they all have different toxicities to the skin itself. It's also challenging to, de to define what an adverse reaction really is or if it was even reported correctly when performing the chart review. I know this firsthand from the study that we did. In the paper that I helped write, I could recall collaborating with my colleagues to figure out the numerous variables that we were all curious about. And I'm sure that you're thinking about these in the back of your mind too. These include the location of the peripheral IV and sorting it out, whether it was in the proximal extremity, the wrist, the hand, um, also, we considered the different sizes of the peripheral IVs with regards to the gauge. We had to wonder, like, which size is optimal or the safest? Is it a 16, an 18, a 20, a 22? It, it was it was easy for us because, again, we were just looking at phenylephrine. But again, one has to consider the differences between dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, phenylephrine, vasopressin. And now we have no clue what to do with Geopreza because there's no data whatsoever as to peripheral IVs in Geopreza. And Geopreza is angiotensin too, by the way. Then one has, one has to consider the maximum rate of infusion as well as the total duration of infusion. I mean, do you have to have a cutoff for this? And do you have to have a max dose of Levofed or Epi, et cetera, et cetera? And lastly, one has to define how you're going to evaluate complications. I mean, Again, you can see how easy it is for all this to become quite the pain in the butt. All in all, the authors looked at 23 studies that included both adults and children with a total of more than 16,000 patients. What they found was that the incidence of adverse events was just 1.8% in adults, which they say is low incidence, and I tend to agree with them, especially with all the morbidity that you're going to avoid. A bit of insight here, as my email just went off, is that most studies used 20 gauge IVs or larger in veins that are proximal to the hands. The authors do state, and I definitely agree with this, that we need high additional high quality research. The caveat to this though is, again, knowing how cumbersome and complicated collecting and analyzing these data could be, is that I find it hard pressed that somebody will do a prospective large study with multiple vasopressors anytime soon. First of all, you cannot blind the nurses as well as the physicians. So there's an inclination of bias that could be incorporated here. I mean, you can't say, oh, this patient doesn't have a central line when the doctor clearly remembers putting in a central line. But that being said, you also have to have that problem with consent here, which is, which is enter entertaining to me because you can't go to the patient and say, hey, by the way, if you're in the peripheral vasopressor group, there's a chance your arm might fall off. 
obviously saying your arm is going to fall off is a joke, but what I really mean by that is that they might develop either limb ischemia or tissue necrosis. So the next logical question is some self-reflection as to what I do in my practice. And, and in case you're curious, this is not a medical recommendation. This is just the protocol that I put together at my shop. I've honestly been using peripheral vasopressors for multiple years now and thankfully have had zero complications from it. But again, I'm trying to be as safe as possible in the process because, again, I don't want there to be any limb ischemia or tissue necrosis. I try to use only phenylephrine and norepinephrine through the peripheral IVs. My opinion is that if you need to be on more than 10 mics of norepinephrine, you, you need that patient needs a central line. Just make the call and put in the central line. If you notice that the vasopressor doses are increasing quickly, you also need a central line. The other caveat is that if a patient is on peripheral vasopressors for more than 24 hours, chances are they need some they need a central line and also sprinkle some midodrin in there, which I've covered in the past. I've made exceptions to these points from time to time when, say, there's a terminally ill patient who is just waiting for a family member to arrive from out of town to say goodbye. Yeah, I'm going to let them slide. For the most part, we're all good with peripheral vasopressors at my shop. We try to use 20 gauge IVs proximal to the hands, and there's a whole checklist that the nurses have to evaluate to see if the IV meets criteria for being viable for peripheral vasopressors. This includes certain caveats such as a lack of resistance when they push, good pullback, and things of that nature. But if the patient even hints that the IV burns, we're stopping. We're just not playing around there. Because again, at the end of the day, patient safety comes first. Now, I know the next question is, how do we deal with extravasation injuries? Or do we do fentolamine or you know, topical nitroglycerin? And that's not something I'm going to touch up on this post, but I might go ahead and cover it at another time. All in all, thanks so much for following along with this podcast. I hope you guys appreciate it and learn something from me. If so, thanks for giving me good reviews and liking, comments, subscribing, and all those uh, generic things that we say. Thanks a lot, guys. Hope, hope you all have a great day. Bye.